kind of a challenge I would have to anybody who watches the Is Genesis History movie. When one side presents their argument, it sounds compelling mm -hmm. until somebody comes and cross-examines them. Welcome back. Today, in episode 6 of Is Genesis History Science? We join Del Tackett and Arthur Chadwick, PhD. Arthur is a taphonomist. What the hell is a taphonomist, you ask? Well, a taphonomist studies the processes, such as burial, decay, and preservation, that affect animal and plant remains as they become fossilized. Let's see how this specialization helps Arthur understand the history represented by fossils found in the Lance Formation in Wyoming. If the dinosaurs had died suddenly in the flood, wouldn't it be obvious? I'm not sure I'm thrilled to hear that reference to the flood, as proving the historicity of the Genesis account is supposed to be the goal of this creationist film. This could be construed as a form of the red herring logical fallacy as the alleged occurrence of the Flood is really what needs to be proven here. The phrase, if the dinosaurs had died suddenly, is the distraction, or red herring in this case. What we're dealing with here, this is in the Lance Formation. This is an Upper Cretaceous sedimentary deposit. Arthur mentions the Cretaceous period here. Oddly enough, he fails to mention the apparent contradiction. The Cretaceous is a geologic period that spans 79 million years from the end of the Jurassic period, 145 million years ago, to the beginning of the Paleogene period, 66 million years ago. Both Arthur and Dell believe the Earth to be around 6,000 years old. Guess he forgot. What we have here, it's called a bone bed. It's an accumulation of bones that's about a meter thick, a little less than a meter. And in this meter, we find the bones present as a graded bed. The little bones at the top, and the bigger bones at the bottom. Interesting description of the dig at the Lance Formation. You can bet, however, that Arthur is going to revisit this graded bed issue, as it's a commonly used creationist argument. And you can see here, looks like we're working on another vertebra here. This is a cervical vertebra of a duck-billed dinosaur. Here's where the spinal cord goes, right there. Also very interesting. When I look at these bones in the quarry, I often think of them as being inside the animal alive and just imagine what it's like to be seeing these bones for the first time. So this is just full of bones and it's not like we have to go looking for where the bones are. We just have to sit down and start digging. Filler. That was all filler. What is mainly different about the sites that you're digging here? as opposed to what we'd say a general dinosaur dig somewhere. Well, there are dinosaurs found all over the world. But this particular site is unique in that it's probably one of the largest collections of bones in the world. And there are remains of, I'd say, between five and 10,000 animals, each 20 to 40 feet long in this deposit. These are big animals, and there are a lot of them. That's a very interesting detail about that dig at the Lance Formation. I bet we can learn a lot from all those fossils. Let's step back for just a second. Okay, so we had a duckbill dinosaur roaming around the Earth, and all of a sudden he dies. Would it become a fossil? Fossilization requires very special circumstances. Normally we know, for example, if a coyote dies out in the desert, his body is soon gone. Yet these bones are all perfectly preserved. Not if they're fossilized, they aren't. The original bone is long gone. Fossils are formed in a number of different ways, but most are formed when a plant or animal dies in a watery environment and is buried in mud and silt. Soft tissues quickly decompose, leaving the hard bones or shells behind. Over time, sediment builds up over the top and hardens into rock. As the encased bones decay, minerals seep in, replacing the organic material cell by cell in a process called petrification. They have never been subjected to weather. Assertion without evidence. They're just all there. Today it would be very difficult to imagine how you could do that. You heard that, right? The taphonomist says he has no idea how fossilization occurs. 
And what's with the inclusion of the word today? Does he not realize that today, right now, an antelope bone may be starting the long fossilization process somewhere? To some extent, we would say that to find a fossil is rare. Even though we have many, many fossils, in terms of things that die, it's rare that they become fossilized. It is rare, and requires special circumstances, not the least of which is rapid burial. These animals had to die, and then their carcasses had to have time to rot, so we're talking days or weeks or months, during which time the bones and tissues were either eaten away or rotted away, and then the bones that remained were deposited instantaneously in this environment because they're in a graded bed with big bones at the bottom and little bones at the top, and you can see here, the big bones are all down at the bottom, and when they start digging up here, they start to find smaller bones. So that condition requires a sorting process that can only take place during catastrophic emplacement. So, when we look at the dinosaur fossils, rather than looking at them from the standpoint of we have early dinosaurs, and middle dinosaurs, and later dinosaurs, you're looking at it from the perspective that all those dinosaurs were in existence. They were all living, and then there was this huge catastrophe that brought them to an end. Alright, let's ignore for a minute that Arthur seems to be the undisputed king of the run-on sentence. Remember when he mentioned the graded bed earlier, and I said he'd be getting back to it? Well, here it is. Both of these guys are trying to say that since all these fossils are located together and in a graded bed, the entire site could be considered evidence for a global flood which is what they're referring to when they say catastrophic emplacement and catastrophe. Unfortunately for a global flood to be correct, all fossils from all species of living things would need to be found in the same layer of the earth whenever the global flood occurred. That means you should be able to find a human skeleton next to a dinosaur's. This has never been the case, ever. The dinosaurs were already dinosaurs when they first appeared. They looked just like what anyone would think a dinosaur would look. And this is an enigma for those who believe in evolution of the dinosaurs. It would only be enigmatic if the premise, dinosaurs were already dinosaurs when they first appeared, was in any way accurate. It isn't. At least not in the way Arthur wants it to be. Of course anything called a dinosaur was a dinosaur from birth to death, but that's not what he means. Listen to their next exchange and you'll see what I mean. But we hear a lot about transitional forms. What's the real story there? Scientists have been able to lay out some forms that they think are transitional, and some of them are very interesting, some even challenging, but they are the exception to the rule. The rule is, there are no transitional fossils. And what we find in the fossil record, and counter to Darwin's hoax... Darwin's hoax? Is he serious? Darwin certainly got the ball rolling, but he died in 1882. Since then, continuous research and refinement of the theory of evolution has resulted in one of the most well-supported theories in the history of science. It is falsifiable, and yet, in all that time, has not been falsified. Even if Darwin had perpetrated a hoax, all research since his death has only strengthened the theory. As for his no transitional fossils rule, only willful ignorance would allow one to make such a statement. One very robust chain of transitional species we have is of Equus, the horse. Oh, and since the topic seems to be dinosaurs, we've got those two. So yes, there are no transitional fossils, except for all the transitional fossils. This is the rule, is that a form exists in the fossil record, it basically stays unchanged, and then disappears from the fossil record without having been changed. That's got to mean something besides evolution, because we don't ever see changes from this form into this form in the rocks themselves. That has to be either blatant dishonesty or head-in-the-sand ignorance. Do I need to bring the picture back up? We actually have a huge number of transitional fossils and links between species. While it's true that we won't be able to find every single fossil for every single species that has ever existed, 
we have more than enough to accept the fossil record as extremely important evidence for evolution. So it's coming from somewhere else. It's a paradigm that's being imposed on the data, rather than the data providing the paradigm. So I think it's very easy for me to be a creationist just based on my flawed understanding of the complexity of life forms. And when we look at the fossil record, the complexity is all there from the beginning. And this begs the question of where did all this complexity come from? Paradigm being imposed on the data? I find it hypocritical that someone who starts with the firm belief that the Bible is 100% factually accurate and then tries to shoehorn any and all data into compliance with that presupposition would make such a statement. As for complexity being there since the beginning, perhaps Arthur would like to discuss relatively simple Precambrian life forms. Probably not, though. It's one thing to have faith. I have faith that God was the creator. But that's substantiated by what I see around me. To say I have faith that evolution produced this, when I can't even see how it could have happened, that's blind faith. Well, there it is. First, an admission that he's starting with the creator presupposition, and admitting only data that supports that presupposition. Earlier in this video, we've seen examples of ignoring conflicting data, such as transitional species. Secondly, he states, I can't even see how it could have happened. The classic argument from incredulity. That's a leap in the dark. That's a leap in the dark. That's actually a pretty funny statement coming from two people who want to drag us back into the dark ages. It seemed that everywhere I looked, there was a growing body of evidence that fit the historical record of Genesis. It wasn't just one thing. It was many things pointing in the same direction. When I was with Art, he told me about some recent discoveries of materials inside of dinosaur bones. To hear this material completely misrepresented, as we creationists love to do, make sure you return for the next installment in the series of Is Genesis History Science? Well, that's it for episode 6 of is Genesis History Science? I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, remember to subscribe to both Psystrike and Paulagia channels. See you next time!